Christ. And I, I speak primarily this afternoon to members of the Lord's Church, to, Christ, to Christians, to be able to examine ourselves. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. The King James says, examine your own selves. The American Standard says, try. So you get the idea of putting yourself to the test. The idea of right kind of evaluation of your life, your thoughts, your words, your actions, and so on. So try or examine your own selves, whether ye are in the faith. Prove your own selves, 2 Corinthians again, 13, 5. We also have this stated in the 1 Corinthian epistle, chapter 11 and verse 28. But let a man examine or prove himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Well, you see, that's applied to what the Lord wants us to be about, that when we observe the Lord's Supper, we're doing it correctly. It is an act of worship, one of five, in the worship assembly of the saints on the first day of the week. And you could take that same principle and not just apply it to the, absor the observance of the Lord's Supper when it comes to the bread representing the body of Christ given on our behalf, sacrificed for us, a sinless body, or the fruit of the vine representing the blood shed for the remission of sins from our Lord. But it has to do with what about the singing? Where is my mind when I'm singing? Prayer in particular, am I following the leader and is the leader mindful of where he's leading us? And so on it goes when you're planning to make your contribution, which is a command, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. It's part of being faithful. It's an, Part of being worshiping, part of worshiping correctly on the first day of the week, the purposing and the planning to be able to give as you've been prospered, making sure that you're giving not grudgingly, well, I have to do this, so I'll do it, but cheerfully because you want to give to the Lord and the fact that you are giving to the Lord. I think some members have a problem remembering because it is, it is a physical thing and it's used for physical things that you're giving this to the Lord. Think of the sacrifices under the law of Moses and how that from time to time God would say as those burned sacrifices uh, smoke ascended, it's a sweet smelling savor to the Lord. Well, I want my worship acts to be sweet smelling savors to the Lord. Well, that involves me examining myself because we're to worship God in spirit and in truth. So it's not just enough, only enough, to do it as the truth teaches. So we spent a lot of time on that in the recent lectureship about truth. But I must have my mind centered upon the one I worship. And I must be offering these acts of praise, these acts of devotion to God. Now that also involves ourselves speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody. Notice it involves me, it involves God, it involves each one of us, uh, speak and make humility of my heart to the Lord. The heart strings must be plucked. That's the, the Greek word solemnus there. That's what's going on. Uh, that is the idea of it starts in the heart. You know, when you, you see Paul referring the Romans back to when they became Christians to motivate them to faithful service, he would point out Romans 6, 17, and 18, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you being made, then made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness. So examining ourselves is a lifelong project. It doesn't stop. And these passages, I think, make it uh, quite clear. There ought to be then a daily activity in our minds, a, a, a review a life review live daily because all, all we have is today. That's another thing that comes to mind on this examination is we not to take thought or worry or be anxious about the things of tomorrow, Jesus said, for sufficient unto the day 
is the evil thereof. And if you live a righteous life today, you're ready for whatever may come tomorrow. I, if you think about it, there's people right now really pondering and, and what we would say worrying or anxious about tomorrow. And yet they're not going to see tomorrow. <laughs> they're going to die before, from now till then, they're, they're, they're going to be gone. Well, to the child of God who's faithful in obedience to the truth and living righteous lives, won't it be a wonderful thing when you're thinking about getting ready and you don't, you don't have, there is no blue Monday for you. You just skip that and go right into one eternal day, so to speak. And that's the way we ought to live. So this examination that we ought to do is something that ought to be on a daily basis. That's, that's what's involved because that's all we have. We have right now. You cannot guarantee me that you'll hear the end of the sermon or that I'll finish it. I can't do it. So we must be honest with God, honest with ourselves, honest with the standard whereby we judge ourselves so we can do the proper examination. We've all gone through some kind of physical examination. And if the doctor or whoever's doing it knows what they're doing, then they know what to look for to give you... A, a clean bill of health within reason. Now, if you've already got some little something wrong with you and they go to zeroing in on that, then you're going to get a lot more <laughs> examined. But we understand we want that to happen. We want that doctor or whatever medical people are involved, all the machines involved, to work up to whatever they're to do in the modern age of technology because we want things to be seen as they are and if they're treatable so they can be treated. I don't know if anybody doesn't want that. If you can be restored to, as we pray sometimes, to a reasonable amount of health, we want that. But then if that is the case, what about spiritual health? That's the most important. Again, you're going to die. That's all there is to it. Now, it's getting about time to hit the pulpit again. But no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so we're just, it's just one of those things that there's something about us. We've always dwelt in a physical body, in a material world, and we've always perceived everything that we deal with through touching it and tasting it and hearing it and seeing it and smelling it. And it's hard to believe that I can exist outside this body. And the Bible said all the time, you are. You are. And that's where you're going to be a long, long time. Well, take out time. You're going to be there forever. There is no measurement of time as we know it. So examine yourself with that reality in mind. I remember... When our children were little and we lived in Muskogee, an old brother who had preached for a long, long time, in fact, he's passed away since we lived here, he, uh, Paul Epps, he's written some of our songs. You may have seen his name. Uh, his, uh, he was from Muskogee originally. And uh, we were visiting at his mother-in-law's house when they came by, Sister Teresa Osborne. And... Uh, our kids, uh, you know, they were little. Like, they don't stay there long, but they were little. <laughs> and he was looking at them. He said, you know, you've got to remember something. He said, right now your time is just filled up with these kids. He said, you probably, and I think, uh, they'll always be here. There'll just be kids around your body, your feet, and uh, hanging on you. And you're always preparing yourself to take care of you know, their needs. And that governs everything. But he said, it's not going to happen. It's not going to always be that way, and faster than you know it, they're going to be gone. Well, you've heard some of us say that, me included. But the point he was making is you still got to plan, plan for your life when the kids are no longer in the house. That's true. He said uh, you're, you're supposed to be concerned about them now. They, too many homes don't center around their children and what the home is expected to do. But he says if you live a normal life, you're going to live a lot longer without them being in your home than you are with them in your home. So don't forget that. Well, that's a form of an examination, isn't it? And here was a man that uh, was pretty wise and spent his life as a gospel preacher and studying the Bible. I thought it was some pretty good advice. So we need to be understanding how we examine ourselves. 
You know, that means I've got to be able to criticize myself, but not criticize myself to the point where I just beat myself down around the ears and I'm just kind of, uh, what is, what is the little uh, donkey's name, Eeyore? That's the way some of us are, if you remember Eeyore. He just sort of looks like you couldn't cheer him up any way you tried. Well, you're not to beat yourself down. You See, you can't stop being human and fallible. You can't. You can't stop making mistakes. You're a human being. If you could have lived the life Christ lived, you could have died on behalf of everybody else. But you've been sinless. Any person who could live life sinless could have died on behalf of others. We can't do that. It took the Lord Jesus Christ coming down and becoming a man and then overcoming the temptations of the devil as a man. Sometimes I think we think, well, he overcame temptations of the devil because he's God. No, he overcame the temptations of the devil as a man. Tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. You see, that's talking about man. You can't tempt God. But when he put himself in the form of a man, he made himself subject to whatever we're subject to. And thus the devil had access to him. And he could have sinned, but he did not sin. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful to make that statement about yourself? I could, but I didn't. But we have. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, separation from God, Romans 6.23. Now, when you become a Christian, you have to come to grips with the fact that I'm a sinner, I'm lost, it's my fault, I can't pass the buck. I did it, or didn't do it as the case may be, sin of commission or sin of omission. And I stand separated from God because I separated myself from God. I can't blame my wife or my husband or my children or my parents or anybody else. I transgress God's will. And more likely, enjoyed it when I did it. Sin, you know, the temptation to sin can't be something that, that's something we would abhor. It has to be something that draws us. It has to be something that looks good and so on. So am I willing, first of all, to understand how Satan approaches me when I examine myself? And then as I examine myself, am I able to see the weak links in the chain in my life without becoming an Eeyore? <laughs> because I know from the Bible also that I am so important that the best heaven has, of which there could be no better came to earth and became a man and died for me. You explain that to me. You explain the worth of one single solitary human being that God himself would come to earth, become us. In a world that he created perfect and his other creation, man polluted it, and yet he came into it anyway Without destroying it, so I'll start over because he had the power to do that. So he could save us out of this mess. So am I able to understand that I have to look enough at myself to be honest and objective and see my sins and weaknesses, but at the same time know my importance in that God sent his only begotten son. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it builds up a proper self-worth. It's not an empty pride. It's not being blown up, thinking of myself better than anybody else. But it is a reality that I'm worth that much. And that therefore I ought to not beat myself down around the ears, but I ought to keep trying to do better. And there's never an end to the self-examination. That's one reason you have such comments as, and why beholdest thou the mote that's in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that's in thine own eye, Matthew 7, 3. It all begins here. And if you will notice Paul's instruction to the young preacher Timothy, he talked about it beginning with Timothy first, and then to others. When he addresses the elders, the shepherds of the flock, he addresses them, you take heed to yourselves. 
then to the flock. And that's the way it works. How can a father, a husband and a father, be the godly husband and father and fulfill the role God has given him? And I'll say the same thing about the wife and mother. If they're not able to properly examine themselves and in doing so realize the place God has put them and the order of things that God has set out and the work he's ordained for them, yet realizing all of the fallibility that there is with us. I don't know of anything that will drive a person to one's knees in deep prayer and supplication that when one stops and considers what a, what a charge I have, and you tend to say it like the Bible does, it's too great for me. So where do you go to find the strength you need? Where do you go to be able to fulfill the role God has assigned to you? Then you remember all these Old Testament accounts where people were called to do something that, and, and, and they didn't think they were worthy and, they didn't, and God said, you know, I've called you. I'm with you. Go. Think of Moses himself. Think of how at first he tried to make excuses. God got ready to put out with Moses, in fact. And that's the only time, once that happened, that's the only time that ever happened in Moses' life. He never did try to make excuses again. Never. So think about it in your various roles. It doesn't make any difference whether it's husband, wife, father, mother, or children. They're old enough to understand their role in the family. Or whether it's elders, elders' wives, preachers, preachers' wives, deacons, and deacons' wives. When you realize the significant position God has put you in, it's greater than any United States senator, greater than any House, U.S. House of Representatives, any governor, or any president, or any king, or any emperor. It's according to God's way of things being done on this earth. Now, he's the one that set it up that way. Don't you think he takes note of it? That he understands it? He recognizes it? But if he has called us to do that through the teaching of the Bible of what marriage in the home, parenting is, or anything else when it comes to the church and its organization, work and worship, he knows we can do it. So in examining ourselves, I first must realize I can't do it by myself. But cooperation with God, I can do it. Thus Paul would say it this way. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Why is that in your Bible? What do you get out when you read it? Do you make it a personal thing? Do you say it like Paul said it of himself? I can. I am able to do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Well, I can't understand how he's going to strengthen it, Paul. You think Paul understand, understood every way in the world these things would happen? Because remember, he had a thorn in the flesh. He said, I prayed three times that the Lord would remove it. And the answer to the prayer was this, my grace is sufficient for thee. Which meant you're stuck with that thorn. And you've got to work. Sometimes things that make that look to us as they're burdened down and, and, and we'd like to get rid of them, maybe if we really looked at it, it would make us draw closer to God in the study of His will and to be closer to Him in obedience to that will rather than saying, I wish I was rid of this. I wish it was gone. I pray to God about it. And then we end up, that's all we concentrate on. And we lose sight of what life in the church is all about. And the spreading of the gospel and the influence for good, we just lose sight of it because we're trying to get rid of all these little things like that. Now, I'm not talking about sin in your life. I'm talking about the lot we have in life. Uh, I, you know, you can't choose what's going to happen to you. There may be some things we do in life that, that have brought on things later on, but still... Uh, things are going to happen to us. You cannot guarantee me today that you will not be in a car wreck that will paralyze you or put you through all sorts of a mess that will change the rest of your life. Can't do it. You cannot tell me you may have a stroke today that puts you flat on your back for years to come in a nursing home in a vegetative state. You just can't. Because it's happening to people all the time. People say, why did that have to happen to me? Well, why, why not happen to you? 
Are you something special from everybody else? Aren't you subject to the common lot of everything else, everybody else on this planet? Yeah. Well, then what are we going to do with what we have to do with? So I have to examine myself to understand that. We don't want to be like that Pharisee. I thank thee that I am not as the rest of men, Luke 18, 11. That didn't set well in any way whatsoever with God. Because this man had the wrong estimation of himself, and he was judging himself or examining himself and coming to a conclusion that God does not want any man to do. One of the things, and this is one of those things that uh, varies with people, there are those individual people who are more of a people person than other people. Sometimes you have to work on cultivating an interest in other people. The man who prayed, Oh Lord, bless me and my wife, our son John and his wife, us four and no more. Uh, I think he made a he didn't do the right kind of examination of what the Bible says about prayer and his attitude toward everybody else. Well, it's very easy to get that way. You know, it's very easy for us to become very happy about ourselves to the exclusion of other people. But what is fellowship? What is fellowship? Not looking each of you to his own things, Paul wrote but each of you also to the things of others, Philippians 2, 4. That means by my conduct, I have to think about you. I don't know how you are. I, I've never understood this as long as I preached. How can I be an effective, faithful preacher of the gospel and all that that means, growing out of my Christian attitude and view, <coughs> If I'm not concerned about how my brethren live before God. They're my brothers and sisters in the family of God. They all heard the same gospel from the heart obeyed it and added to the church for the same Lord. Now you see it's not quite that hard to raise that question when we turn around and say. How does a mother and father really show their love and concern for their kids. And not have anything to do with them. See, you can understand that then, don't you? But it works the same way in the spiritual family of God. We don't just leave one another alone. Or how do you apply Galatians 6 2? Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Or what Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans 12 and verse 15 Rejoice with them that rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Now that doesn't imply, or more than that, a closeness of the brethren in the Lord. I, I don't know what it says. I think it's just summed up, or at least the golden rule is summed up in the idea of whatsoever you would that, you, uh, that others have you do unto them, then you, you do to them. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Get it out in that way. So that's, that's an important point, Matthew 7, 12. How do you apply that? In other words, there is, a, you know, when you get in psychology, there's applied psychology. Well, there's applied Christianity, and that's the kind that matters. You can quote scripture all day long, and you can explain it. You can cause people mentally to understand it if they're doing their part as a student. It's another thing to do it in every situation, thus Paul would teach things like I bring, I buffet my body and bring it into subjection lest after having preached to others I myself am to cast away. What does that mean? I do the truth that I teach to others. I do the truth that I teach to others. How do you do the truth? Well, you comply with the Lord's will in given situations as that will calls on you to act in those situations. All of it's going to come back now to the matter of self Examination. A teacher asked a small boy what lesson he got from the story of the Good Samaritan found in Luke 10, 30 37. He replied this way, The lesson I got from it is that when I'm in trouble, my neighbors ought to help me. 
the old thought of self-interest. We should think of life in terms of serving rather than being served. It makes life more meaningful, especially Christian, and that word is of Christ, and I'm a member of the family of God, which means we have to be doing the will of God. I may find this very enjoyable to do, but is it what God said do? Or if he spoke on how to do it, is it how he said do it? There's how we really show trust and faith in God is taking him at his word. I'm going to close with this. I've got to keep myself fit to live with. You know, a whole lot of problems with people, and it gets into emotional, mental problems is that when they look down deep inside themselves, they can't stand to live with themselves. I think there is a great place for psychology, but not modern psychology. Go to the one who created us and put us together, and then look at the Bible that tells us how to live. And it's going to deal with the mindset. It's going to deal with the way we're to think and how we're to purpose and the motives. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, Proverbs 4.23. It has been of interest to me for a long, long time. I cannot tell you. I remember uh, how long. I remember when I, when I took, Jody will remember this, when I took an educational psychology course. And that's designed to show, try to teach people that at this certain age, this child just doesn't have the ability to do this, so you have to approach the child this way. It's the whole idea behind our, our different class system. I mean, while we don't try to uh, teach a five-year-old the same as we would a 16-year-old. Maybe nowadays that's not as far distant between it. But uh, nevertheless, there is that breakdown of things. Well, what we did, they had a, they had a little test, and I, I put all the kids through it. <laughs> they were my guinea pigs. And I can remember that what they said actually would happen. If you take a child at roughly four years old and you start saying, this is to that, like this is to that, you won't get anywhere with them. Their, their brain hasn't developed well enough to make that. You know why? At least it used to be that kindergartners had the big old round pencils. Supposed to, anyway. Because they hadn't developed enough in their motor skills and muscles to be able to handle the regular size pencil. Well, there's no use expecting out of that child in the normal situations it to be able to use what it's not developed to use. When I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. You know, if parents don't learn that, they're going to be miserable parents trying to raise their children because they'll expect out of those children what their children can't give them. That's mentally as well as physically. So sometimes people in dealing with themselves to honestly evaluate their lives, examine it in the light of God's truth, they've got to realize uh, the heart must be the inward man where the mind is. It must be right with God. You know, we sing a song like that. Is thy heart right with God? That's what that song's designed to do to make us think about these kind of things. Man must live up to the knowledge he possesses in order for him to respect himself. There's not much said about that anymore, about learning how to have respect for yourself. Again, if you consider all God's done for us, we never could do for ourselves, and try to say, why me? And then you sing a song, love lifted me. And all these songs that are anchored in those fundamental matters of how we were put together by God and we'll begin to see how you cause a person to have respect for himself. Many times on the news nowadays, you will see people, uh, this happened to this one, little baby killed, that's almost every day. You see this one doing this and that, and you say, how? They don't have respect for themselves. Because they didn't come out of an environment that taught them anything, that showed them how to have any respect that showed them that they had any worth about them at all. Well, if anything that God shows us in the Bible and all that Christ, God through Christ has done for us 
you're worth a whole lot. You're worth more than what you can begin to grasp when you consider for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But we are made free moral agents. Thus we must, through our intellect, grasp the way of salvation in the gospel, which is God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16. And we must realize then that I've got to turn my way around. I've got to turn from a way of practice sin to turn to the Lord's way of practicing righteousness, and that's called repentance. Confess my faith in the Christ and then be baptized for the remission of my sins. That's what I can do in accepting the grace of God. And I'll begin to build up a worthwhile attitude toward myself, toward my family, toward everybody, really. And when you see these people in such a mess, you won't be so angry at them. I'm not saying it won't upset you. But you'll be more like Jesus standing over on Mount of Olives looking at Jerusalem and saying, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered you unto myself, even as a chick, hen gathers her chickens unto her. Now watch. And ye would not. So when you start examining yourself, it gets right down to the first principles of the basics of the fundamentals. <laughs> it's what it's all about. But it all comes back to that, or I could never say to anybody who's not a Christian, you need to obey the gospel by considering what you are before God, where you stand lost in sin, and the need you have to respond to the gospel invitation. I can never appeal to members of the church saying, are you living like you know the Bible says you ought to live? Have you stumbled back into sin? Do you need to repent of those sins? What is that? None of that makes any difference at all if you can't examine yourself, honestly examine yourself, and in the light of what the Bible says, and in view of the worth of your own life from God's perspective. So as we close the lesson, please think about this important matter of being able to be fit for you to live with, and then you will start maybe being fit for a lot of other folks to live with. Think about it. There's got to be some way it works, and I think I know the way in the whole gospel story. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, then we invite you to come while we stand and sing.